Ready? Chapter 7 Truth The group reached Yua's camp within a couple of hours of walking. The mages were all carrying the extra weapons they took from the assailants. The sun is starting to set, so most of the officers should be on their way back, Yua said as he looked to the horizon. Some of them should be carrying today's catch. Once they are all back, We'll eat and then pack up and leave for the next camp. It looks like it will be a clear night, so we should have no problem navigating in the dark. Avoiding any more ambushes should be our top priority right now. Keon and Aino looked around. No tents, just a couple of quenched campfires and some logs around for them to sit on. Nothing else. Do you sleep right on the ground under the bare sky? Aino asked the officers. Yes, as we never get sick, there is no need for any extra equipment at the camps. If it rains, we'll just sleep under a tree. What we need, we carry with us at all times. We don't leave anything at the camps. They are here temporarily, and so are we, Yua answered her. The six of them sat down around one of the campfires, as Leah brought the fire back to life. Aino could see a tear discreetly leaning back trying to get a glimpse of her back. It was made quite obvious that he wanted to talk to her, ask her questions about today's episode. But he didn't say anything. It seemed like he was really struggling with this whole order of not being allowed to talk directly to her unless spoken to first. As the officers came back, one after another carrying supplies of different kinds, Aino noticed that there were no sergeants of any rank. She turned to Tyr. No specialist officers? He almost jumped in shock from her finally speaking to him. Neither army have any such ranks. As a recruit in a blood army, you go straight to training as an officer cadet. Once you graduate, you officially become a soldier and can participate in battles. Only a few of those who graduate are chosen to become officers. It all depends on how many slots are available. But all soldiers have the training and the knowledge of an officer, he answered her. So now that all the officers are out, what are the soldiers and cadets doing? Aino asked too. They're on permission. Most of them are probably just fishing, reading or growing plants. Maybe even out picking mushrooms and berries. At least, that's what I would do during free time, he said and smiled at her. What do you mean during free time? Atlas' stern voice was heard. You always pick berries, even on duty. Tyr looked a little hurt. Just because you don't appreciate the fine taste of fresh berries doesn't mean I'm the same. Berries are among the tastiest things in this world. If I see them, I pick them, no matter where I am, and it has never intervened with my duties. He crossed his arms in a determined manner. <clears throat> I know cleared her throat. So, what kind of training does a cadet go through? Till was quick to respond. Everything that is needed to survive as a soldier. From basic physical training to hands-on-hands combat. All cadets go through the same training. You learn how to handle every weapon, from bow to sword to axe and so on. Hunting, for example, is included. That way you get both practice of aim and food to feed the soldiers. Also classes of a mere theoretical nature, like tactics on the battlefield. We teach them how to survive alone in the wild as well. What in nature you can and cannot eat. For example, berries. Some of the graduated soldiers become teachers themselves. Even some officers teach classes, myself included. Till paused and looked at Aino. I teach culinary classes, he pointed proudly to himself. She raised her eyebrows. I bet you do. The last of the officers returned to the camp just as the food was ready. Cain was so happy he could cry. He finally got to eat. It had been such a long time since there had been any food in his stomach. As the officers were sitting around the campfires, finishing up the last of their meals, Yua stood up. It's gotten dark. We need to move. Pack it up, everybody. We're heading out for the next camp. A murmur was heard as all the officers prepared to leave.
The moonlight lit up the road as they pushed forward. Once again Kion walked in the middle, with Aino on his back. The lower-ranked officers formed the outer ring, while the higher officers were the closest to the middle. Kion could almost feel the ground shaking as the mages moved. All the mages were taller than him, with Lia being among the shortest ones. She was about half a head taller than him, which would put her around 190 centimeters, give or take. Kion knew that in normal circumstances he would feel tired right about now, but he was pretty much running on fear as fuel at the moment. The more mages he met, the more terrifying the situation seemed. He had seen firsthand what they were capable of. He turned his head and looked at Aino. She smiled at him. He wanted to ask her about that scene she had showed him when she was unconscious. He couldn't ask now. Even if he whispered, there was a chance someone else could hear. He had to wait. They reached the second camp around the same time as they had reached the first camp the previous day. There wasn't much that separated it from the first one. No tents, only campfires and logs to show that people had even been there. Don't get too comfortable. We're not staying here either. This time it was Atlas speaking. We'll do what we did at the last camp. Eat once everyone is back and then leave for the next camp. We'll rest once we are there. As the officers started to come back, Aino noticed that there were far less people joining at this camp than at Yuwas. She turned to Tyr, who, unsurprisingly, had set himself next to her again. We were 14 people when we left yesterday. Now we are barely 17 with the officers here. Is it just this camp? Or is Nila's blood army that much smaller than Ayla's? She asked him. Tyr looked down at the ground. For the first time it looked like he didn't want to answer her question. It didn't used to be like this. But after the last battle, he went silent for a few seconds. I want to say that it is because our vetting processes are different, that we don't take in strays like Ayla does, but that's a lie. Many of our soldiers come with damaged past too. He took a deep breath. Ayla's blood army took out around 1,200 of us. Almost an entire division went down. The second division. The same division I was in. 53 of us were left when Nila called for a retreat. Three officers and fifty soldiers in total, two lieutenant colonels, one second lieutenant and the soldiers of her platoon, the 32nd platoon. In total half of the generals of the army were killed and more than one third of our army was obliterated. Ayla crushed the then lieutenant general's head with her bare hands right in front of Nila. Atle was only a brigadier general back then. He was one of the two who survived. Add on one major general and the general himself, and you have the only generals who made it out alive. That day changed Nila forever. Him and the former lieutenant general had grown up together. Even Ayla knew him. He was always whispering in Nila's ear about revenge, about war being the solution to everything. He rose to power because of nepotism. Once Ayla went after him, he stood no chance. She made an example out of him. It was like she was tired of the fighting and decided to end it all, kill our entire army if needed. I never knew that her army were that strong, but they crushed us like we were nothing. I heard Nila scream at her in anger that he was stronger than her. I'll never forget her cold reply. I'm sure you are, but your army isn't. If anything, those words hit home. Nila knew he had to change, or his own army would perish. As I told you, Atle was only a brigadier general, and the old Nila would have made him, together with the other surviving brigadier general, into major generals, and moved the existing major general to lieutenant general, but he didn't. Instead, he chose Atle over major general Edda, despite the fact that she ranked higher than him. Don't get me wrong, Atle is a very competent general in his own right and definitely deserves the rank he holds right now, but she is a machine. She has no conscience, no empathy, it's like she was born to be a killer. If Nila had told her to kill Atle, she wouldn't hesitate for a second, and that's where they differ. 
For as long as Atla has been in the army, he has had one goal, one goal alone. A truce between the blood armies, and that's what Nila needed. As there were now two available positions as brigadier general, Nila had to choose those from the lieutenant colonel ranks. Jarl and Avid were chosen, which seemed reasonable. Jarl was one of the two surviving lieutenant colonels from the second division, and Avid was a lieutenant colonel under Atle. I was the other surviving lieutenant colonel, and was so promoted to colonel and was put in charge of the fourth brigade. What was odd, however, was that Brigadier General Jurgen wasn't promoted to Major General. Instead, Nila chose one from the second lieutenant's rank, from the last surviving officer of the second division, Desa. Something the old Nila would never have done. You don't take from the second lieutenant ranks and promote straight to Major General. Plus, the one he chose was a person the former lieutenant general had done everything to hold back. However, he was gone now, and Disa's platoon was the only one that survived. Every single one of her soldiers were still alive. Nila knew how competent she was, and did what he felt was right. Nila has always been my general, and I'll always be loyal to him. But that day he grew in my eyes. He did what he had to do put his pride aside and changed his army, changed himself so that he could save us. He went to Ayla, taking only Atle and Lisa with him. They negotiated with Ayla and her generals until they had reached the deal, the truce we have today. Joined in one goal, to find our creator. Tyr finally lifted his head and smiled at Aino.